You were nine and you went to Michigan? No, I was, I was, uh, I think I was 14 when that, when I went to Michigan, twice. You were 14 and you went to Michigan yeah. and you're from Medicine Hat. Were you shy? Were I think you... I'm the shyest person on the planet, which would get, <laughs> which would elicit that response. But you know, I prefer spending time by myself and talking to my dogs and, um, uh, making up shows with things that I build and control, you know, um, uh, yeah, I've always been shy, but the interesting thing is I was willful because I knew that there were some people on the planet who had the information that I needed to continue on with, and I knew they were old, and I, you know, I sat at a puppet festival a few years ago, and a couple guys came up to me who are my age and said, oh, I got that. I, I said in this talk I gave. I said, it wasn't so much that I wanted to know my mentors. I wanted to be my mentors. I wanted to live like they lived and I wanted to do what they did. So I had to go eat their food and sleep under their workbenches and hang out with them. And I, I in a way I had to be anointed by them. Uh, and that's always been important to me. That's really important to me is the, um, I really understand I'm just continuing on in a legacy. I've been handed something that I'm doing my version of now. This is not the definitive marionette work ever, but um, there were expectations from those mentors which were sublime. I loved being young and being given information and being given access, but always with the understanding that a lot was going to be expected from me. Right. You know, I was not allowed to go stay in their houses as a tourist. Um, and if they detected that I wasn't serious or wasn't going to be sitting here at this age still doing it, or hopefully doing it better than they did, then I wouldn't have been allowed in the door. And did they train you? Like, hold this this way, use this. Is they that trained me in the best way. They said, here's how to look at it. Here's why you do it. Uh, here's how we do it. And this is why we do it this way. You know, so I was taught to see, you know. I, I mean, I was taught to draw by one guy strictly. Uh, he said, you don't need to look at magazines and you don't need to look at art books. You have the best model on the planet, you. So I learned the proportion from my eye to my ear with my own hand. And I learned the length of my butt to my knee is the same as my knee to the floor. I learned all of the anatomy I ever needed to know off of my own body. So even when I'm drawing extreme characters, I stand up and I measure myself and then I sit back down and I draw, you know. So they taught me how to see, which was the greatest thing. And they also taught me to copy really young. They were like, okay, here's a picture of so-and-so's work that you admire, copy it. And as soon as you can make it look exactly like theirs, move on to someone else and copy them. And another great line I was given is, you know, style is not something you set out to get. It's something you get when you set out. So they saw that I was a worker bee and that if I copied and just kept ma making puppets and making mistakes and sending them photos, that I was promised, I was promised that one day I would look at my work and go, ah, that's more me than anybody else. That's that's my style. And I remember when it happened, I was 24, and I looked at something I'd made and thought, okay, I can see the influence of so-and-so, and so-and-so, and so-and-so, -and -so, but that's more me. But I was encouraged to just do and fail and try. So for an ancient art form, you intuitively chose an ancient way to work yourself into it and become a master of it. Apprenticeship, copying, yeah. and then emerged the artist that you were. You know, I wasn't the golden boy. There were other golden boys. There were who, were the, there, who were the other golden boys? Well, you know, they, they started emerging in my late teens and in my 20s. There were guys who would do something in San Francisco that was so avant-garde, and he'd get all the attention. And there'd be a guy in New York who did something so avant-garde, and they'd get all the attention, you know? And those guys either quit by the time they were 30 or died, you know? And I just knew that I was the little engine that could, and it probably wouldn't happen till I was in my 30s or even 40. And what it was, the missing factor of young me, was the writer. 
I was pretty good at making a puppet, and I was a pretty good puppet performer, but they weren't really saying anything. And it was around 1994, and I'd already been doing my shows, when Tinka's New Dress premiered, that it all happened. But your Ronnie Burkett uh, the Theater, Theater of Marionettes started in 80, 86, 86, right? and I was doing big genre pieces, you know, like I did a Commedia dell'arte musical and oh, a, a Victorian melodrama musical and a gothic murder mystery musical. And you were writing the scripts for those? Yeah, and they were really campy, tongue-in-cheek, bad boy, high energy, funny um, confections, you know? And that's what I thought I would do forever, and they were getting a lot of attention. Um, and when I wrote Tinka's New Dress, I'd, I, I'd sat in the studio for a full day and sobbed when I finished the first draft of it because I thought, oh, here's a career ender. This will end everything. Um, a show about the Holocaust. Yeah, with puppets. With puppets. With naturalistic puppets, not big, grotesque, batty eye puppets, you know. Um, and not long after someone said oh you've changed your style and I remember saying no I found my style and it was the missing element of going on stage and being committed to the material and saying I desperately want to tell you this story which is what I've done ever since um, the reaction is not always um, uh, you know I don't think I'll ever be a big commercial hit but oh. the success that I feel doing that work every night can't be bought. No. Because they're stories that I'm passionate about. And that was the missing element. And none of my mentors saw that version of me. They all died mm, around the t right before I started Theatre of Marionettes. They were all right. dying off. So they never actually saw what I really did. It's the same with writing Canadian writers. We never thought Canadian writers would get going on Canadian stages. And then there was the push in the 60s yeah. and 70s. So. You did for I, I mean, it's not lost on me that I'm on this stage. This yeah. company has been around for 40 years. And trust me, as a teenager, I heard about factory theater. I heard what was going on in Toronto in those days. And I was fascinated. But I never once thought I would get my ass or my puppets on this <laughs> stage or any of the other stages I got on. You know, so it's, you know, I, I have a great humility for... Uh, for the stages I get to go on because it was, you know, I think kids in theater school assume they'll get on these stages. It's an assumption that if you get in the theater, you'll, right. you know, you play this theater, but you'll get to better ones. You know, this is good enough. Right? This yeah. is a big stepping stone for me.